539 in your hymn books. Let's stand as we sing the song, The Plan Rescue the Perishing. Glad to have each of you here tonight. 539, join with us on that first verse, Rescue the Perishing. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep for the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are slighting him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently, he will forgive if they only believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings like buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, cords that are broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it, strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them, tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Brother John, could you open a prayer for us, please? Hey, maybe you see it at 538, right across the page where you were just a moment ago. Bringing in the sheaves. Let's sing this one. 538, bringing in the sheaves. Sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the noontide and the dewy eve. Waiting for the harvest and the time of reaping, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Sowing in the sunshine, sowing in the shadows, fearing neither clouds nor winter's chilling breeze. By and by the harvest and the labor ended, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, going forth with weeping, Sowing for the master, though the loss sustained, our spirit often grieves. When our weeping's over, he will bid us welcome. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Good to see you out tonight. Glad you made it this evening. And uh, looking forward to a good time in God's house. Just a couple of reminders. Of course, Wednesday night, basement club for the kids. Uh, Bible study here for the church uh, in the auditorium for the adults. And then uh, next Sunday, we have the... Uh, 
uh, regular services again. Choir will be picking back up in March, and so I mentioned that a couple weeks ago, and I mentioned it again today. And uh, so keep in mind with that. And then don't forget the ladies' harvesters have a, a meeting uh, toward the end of the month on the 24th, and so uh, be here for that. Anyone have just a word of testimony you want to share tonight? Uh, anything uh, maybe from this afternoon or this week that you didn't get a chance to share this morning? Some of the Lord's done for you. Uh, yes, ma'am, go ahead. Yeah, the car's probably, yeah. Um, but he got really close to me, hmm. trying to pull around and, yeah. Praise the Lord for protection there then, yeah. Yeah, and pray that she can get that, whatever that's going on with that vehicle taken care of. So. I think I just need new, to new, get another vehicle probably. But, uh, so but pray, praise the Lord for his protection. Anyone else, something you just want to thank the Lord for? Enoch, do you have a, a testimony tonight, something you want to ask? I lost my tooth. You lost your tooth. <laughs> Nice. Looking good, too. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Anyone else tonight? Something you just want to share real quick? Anything else? All right. Yes, sir? Yes, I just, I just uh, want to thank the Lord that, uh, you know, as we, as, as, as Christians, that how we can, as we work together and we fellowship together, that's who, you know. Yeah, amen. Opportunity as Christians to work together, fellowship together, and just be a blessing to each other and, and for each other. Amen. Good for that. Uh, anyone else? Someone just want to share it real quick? All right. Why don't we have some mushers come? Uh, oh, sorry. Is there anyone else in the room? Anybody that I should don't, I should be paying attention to? Go ahead, Miss Jamie. Go ahead. Oh, boy. Every once in a while you get those where it's like you're looking for the hand and you can see people doing this and you're like, what? Who? Go ahead, Jamie. Praise the Lord for the good fellowship we have with other churches, other pastors, and uh, church to church. And and uh, I mentioned last night we were at that uh, meeting over at Lake Milton. There's probably about ten different churches, part of it, and just just people just fellowship and enjoying each other. And uh, there is great joy in fellowship in the Lord. Amen. So praise the Lord for that. Anyone else? I don't want to. I want to make sure I don't miss anyone here. Else I'll get in trouble. So, all right. Uh, let's have Journey and Micah. Could the two of you help us with the offering tonight? Okay. And uh, why don't we have Micah, would you lead in prayer for the offering, please? Amen. Go ahead and take your time. <laughs> gentlemen for helping with the offering tonight by request let's stand to go to 219 219 I've got peace like a river 219 there we go ready for along I've got peace like a river I've got peace like a river I've got peace like a river Love like 
Folks, you can go on down. Get out a piece of paper, pen, or pencil. Let's do a Bible quiz tonight. What is tomorrow? Valentine's Day. So tonight's Bible quiz has to do with the heart. All the disgusting stuff tomorrow, right, Micah? Yeah, Valentine's Day. <laughs> You just keep thinking that until you get a wife, and then it'll be all good, I promise. <laughs> Everything's about, from the Bible, about hearts. Now, I'm going to be honest, this one might be a little tough, because you don't have the clue, like, you know, it starts with a certain letter or things like that, but uh, uh, some of them are, are not just necessarily one word, some might be a little bit of a phrase, but uh, I think we'll do well with this, and if nothing else, we'll learn something. So... Ten questions and a bonus. You write down the answer if you know it, and then we'll go through afterward. Number one, number one. According to 1 Samuel 16, 7, it tells us that God looks on the heart, but man looks on the what? According to that verse, it tells us that God looks on the heart, while man looks on the what? Context was Samuel and eventually David. God looks on the heart, while man looks on the what? Number two. Number two. What should we hide in our hearts that we might not sin against God? What should we hide in our hearts that we might not sin against God? Out of Psalm 119. What should we hide in our hearts that we might not sin against God? Number three. Tell me who this verse is speaking about. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. And I'll give you a hint. There's no specific, it's not a proper name, but it's somebody that the Bible's speaking of. Who is it? What do we reference this person by? The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have... No need to spoil. No, number four. What do the Beatitudes promise those who are pure in heart? Blessed are the pure in heart for what? What do the Beatitudes promise uh, for those that are pure in heart? It says, blessed are the pure in heart for what? Number five, Matthew 6, 21 gives us this principle. It tells us that our hearts will be where our blank is. It tells us that our hearts will be where our blank is. Fill in the blank. Number six, in Daniel chapter one, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not do something. What was it? Daniel chapter 1, Daniel purposed in his heart not to do something. What was that? Number 7. John 14.1 finished this quote. Let not your heart be What? Jesus was speaking, John 14, 1, let not your heart be what? <clears throat> <clears throat> Number eight. 
Number eight. The Bible tells us in Psalm 66 that the Lord will not hear your prayers if you regard blank in your heart. Fill in the blank. The Lord will not hear your prayers if you regard blank in your heart. What is that? Number nine. Jesus, in Matthew 19, Jesus said that Moses wrote a bill of divorcement because of the what? Because of what? Talking to the leaders in Israel on behalf of the nation. Jesus said that Moses wrote a bill of divorcement because of what? Number 10, Psalm 14, verse 1 tells us, uh, uh, gives us this answer. What has the fool said in his heart? What has the fool said in his heart? What hath the fool said in his heart? Anybody need those first 10 repeated before we go to the bonus? Yes, ma'am. Number two. <clears throat> what should we hide in our hearts that we might not sin against God? Anyone else need something repeated? All right, bonus. According to the book of Proverbs in chapter 6, one of the six things that the Lord hates is a heart that deviseth what? Two words to the answer. A heart that deviseth what? Y'all are thinking tonight. All right. Journey, you got 100% on this one, you think? Maybe. Maybe. All right. We'll find out. Huh? How many of you think you got the bonus tonight? Raise your hand. Got about four of you. Uh, how many, not counting the bonus, think you're going to get all ten right? Seth is confident on this one. He, he went. Abby went. <laughs> all right. Let's see how we do. See what we've learned. All right. Number one, according to 1 Samuel 16:7, <clears throat> it tells us that God looks on the heart while man looks on the what? Outward appearance. Good. Outward appearance. Number two. What should we hide in our hearts so we might not sin against God? Word. His word. God's word. Amen. And number three. Uh, did you get that one, Elena? Good. And uh, number three. Uh, who is this verse speaking about? The heart of her husband that safely trusts in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. Who is that? Proverbs the Proverbs 31 woman or the virtuous woman. However you want to label her there. Good. Uh, number four. What do the Beatitudes promise to those that are pure in heart? That what? They shall... See God. They shall see God. Good. Number five, Matthew chapter 6, 21, uh, tells us that our hearts will be where our blank is. What is the blank? Treasure. Treasure. Good. And number six, Daniel chapter 1. Uh, Dan, Daniel purposed his heart not to do something. What was that? Not to defile himself, the king's meat, or the, or the wine. Good. And so we got that one. Number seven, uh, John 41, Jesus is speaking, and he says, Let not your heart be... Troubled. Good. Number eight, the Lord will not hear your prayers if you regard blank in your heart. What is that? Iniquity. Iniquity. Good. Number nine, uh, Jesus said that Moses wrote a bill of divorcement because of what? The hardness of their heart. Good. Hardness of their heart. Excellent. Number ten, what has the fool said in his heart? There is no God. Uh, bonus. According to uh, the book of Proverbs, one of the, one of the six things that, God, things that the Lord hates is a heart that deviseth what? Evil imaginations. Wicked imaginations. Wicked imaginations. Good. All right, so who got the bonus? Raise your hand. All right, there you go. Um, not count the bonus. Got all ten right. Would you raise your hand? Hey. What, Seth? You missed something. All right. Uh, did, got, got all ten right? Miss Jamie did? Good. She must have looked at the, she, she must have looked at the paper right now. Did you get all ten right? Good. Uh, only missed one. Missed two. Miss three, learn something? Good. Amen. Excellent. Excellent. All right, let's get, let's get our Bibles. Would you go with me to the book of Romans, chapter 9 to start? Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9.
Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 1, reading down through verse 3. And then we're going to look at verse, chapter 10, verse 1, and we're going to look at a few other passages this evening. Uh, Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Give you just a moment, so let's see a couple pages turn in here. Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 1, the Bible says this, is Paul talking, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Would you look at chapter 10, verse 1? Brethren, chapter 10, verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is this, that they might be saved. Let's pray. Lord, I ask you to help us tonight, Lord, just as I uh, share my heart this evening, Lord, and just uh, the burden that's you put on my heart, Lord, that you've given me, and, and uh, Lord, I just want to see our church to uh, reach many people with the gospel this year, Lord, reach many souls. I pray, Lord, that you just help us uh, as we uh, take some time tonight, Lord, in the first of a, a few services, Lord, that we'll talk about, um, and just, just trying to re, refocus ourselves on souls. I pray you just bless in all that we do and say tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, we have, uh, oft, oftentimes, maybe not every year, but oftentimes around this time of the year, we uh, have a series, just a reminder, sometimes a real practical kind of thing on how to uh, give the gospel. Uh, we'll probably do that in a few weeks. Uh, we uh, have done things just in regards of different ways, different how to um, understand different passages, to use those in sharing the gospel, a lot of different things like that. And uh, I felt the Lord would have me um, I just Lord, probably about a month or so ago, just began to really burn my heart about the importance of, of uh, re- reviewing some of those things and bringing out a few other thoughts. And, and um, I, I, think, I would assume, I think we all, looking at the crowd that we have here tonight, uh, we all would agree that the Bible teaches us that we're to tell others about Jesus. Amen. Amen. We looked at it a little bit this morning, you know, and, and we looked at Acts 1-8 about being witnesses. Uh, we looked at Matthew 28 about teaching all nations, baptizing and teaching them to observe. Uh, we looked at Mark 16, 15, where it said, preach the gospel to every creature. I believe that, I, I don't think I would have to spend much time tonight to uh, review the fact of the command for us to tell others about Jesus Christ. God gave that to the church. We are here today because people have told us, and God expects us until the day comes that he returns, we're to tell others, preach the gospel, give out the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, when I think about the, in my own life, when I think about just in life of churches and people, Christians, um, the, the truth, the sad truth is this, uh, the vast majority of Christians never lead somebody to the Lord. Uh, a great majority of Christians never even talk to somebody about the Lord. And, uh, you know, I, and we, could, we could bring it right down to, and it is a, a fact of just disobedience to the command, we could bring it to that. But I thought, why is it that we, and I say we, including myself, why is it at times we struggle to do so? We know we're supposed to. Uh, we're thankful that somebody did it for us, showed us the scriptures and, and showed us how to be saved. Uh, we rejoice when other people are saved, but what, what is it? Uh, why don't we reach people with the gospel? And I want to take some time tonight. And also, I don't have a, I don't even have, I don't have an outline really. I have some verses here, which is dangerous because those are the times I usually preach for about an hour. Um, I just want to share my heart, my burden right now. Uh, my, my thought for the night is this, a burden for the lost. That's, that's what I want to preach on, a burden for the lost. Um, we see here in this passage Paul, who of course, uh, he was a Jew, that God used as the, if I could turn this way, the apostle to the Gentiles. And yet at the same time, though he was used to reach many of the Gentiles, we saw a couple weeks ago in in Acts 9 where it talks about how uh, he was, God has chosen to to go to the Gentiles as that chosen vessel. And yet at the same time, obviously when you see through the book of Acts, he would go to the Jew first, and then also to the Greek. He would go into the synagogue and begin to preach, and the Jews would often reject him, and, and they'd go to the Gentiles. And he always had a burden for his people. In, this, in the book of Romans 9, 10, and 11, these chapters deals a lot with what uh, his burden for Israel, about God's dealing with Israel as a nation, those kind of things. 
uh, when, we, when we look at chapter 10 and we use verses in regards to, uh, like verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Uh, when he talks about whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's talking, the context is here, uh, not, he does say that there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, the same Lord, and, and we all are saved the same way, but he's talking about, really in the context, about Israel and how they need to be saved by faith and how they were trying to establish their own righteousness. They, they kept the law, therefore they felt they were, they were good. They were God's people, they were religious, they were, in their opinion, righteous and he's teaching the fact that it's not by our works, it's not that we can establish our righteousness, that God's righteousness is in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, that we believe the fact that he is the Savior, that he died for us, that he rose from the dead, those things. But the passage here, the greater context of these chapters, is his burden, his, his appeal for and to Israel. He says here back in chapter 9, verse 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. He's saying, listen, I, I'm going to tell you something, you have to believe me, I, I promise you this is true. That's basically what he's saying. As God is my witness, in essence, he says that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. There's that burden. You know, when we think about a burden, of course, there are physical burdens, things that are heavy for us to carry, to, to, to lift, to move. Uh, but he's talking so, certainly of that that spiritual burden, something that weighs heavy on him. What was, his, what was his burden? That he wanted Israel to be saved. And why don't you notice in verse 3, he says, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. You understand what he's saying here? He's basically saying this. If Israel would be saved, I'd be willing to spend eternity in hell, in essence, to be accursed from Christ. That's a burden. Now, obviously, that's not what he could, that could not happen, because he was saved, and by God's grace, God saved him, and God kept him, amen. But his heart's desire, as he said there in chapter 10, his heart's desire and prayer was that they might be saved. You think about uh, not only Paul and his burden that he had, I think about Jesus. Uh, in Mark chapter 6, verse 34, Jesus is speaking and are talking, and, and talking about Christ. And it says here in verse 34, it says, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were sheep not having a shepherd. He began to teach them many things. He had a burden for folks. We, we could see, obviously, even on an individual level, how many times Jesus spent time with, with individuals. We talked this morning a little bit about Nicodemus. We know about the, the woman at the well in John chapter 4. We know about the, the lame man by the, the pool there in chapter 5 of John. We know about the, the blind man who was healed, uh, blind from birth, and, and Christ healed him, saved him. We know about the man who was br brought down from, by his friends through the roof, and, and God heals him and saves him. Uh, we see Zacchaeus. He comes to Zacchaeus' house to because the, he said the, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. We, we can see over and over on an individual basis how Christ had a burden for people. We see uh, in Luke chapter 19, uh, Christ weeping over Jerusalem, verse 41, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou the least in this, day, this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hid, from thy eyes, for the day shall come upon thee, and that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. They shall not leave in, the, in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. We see there, we see, I think it's in Luke 13 also, where he he's, uh, makes a statement very similar, just in regards to Jerusalem, and how he's burdened for them, understanding that they have not in Luke 13, it's about after he came in his triumphal entry and how they didn't even understand who he was and what he offered. He was burdened for them. We know that uh, the Bible tells us in, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, it says this, For this is a good and acceptable thing in the sight of our Savior, our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 9 says this, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, 
but that all should come to repentance. Uh, Paul had a burden for people. The Lord Jesus Christ certainly had a burden for people to be reached with the message of the gospel, to be saved. And may I say, folks, we ought to have the same burden, but often, so often we don't. Now I'll say this. It's much easier to have a burden for those that we have an affinity toward. Um, and I'll say that I think, I think sometimes, I'm not saying that we've never had a burden. I'm not saying that maybe even an individual in here does not have a burden. But I think sometimes our burden for souls sort of ebbs and flows. Uh, I don't know of any Christian parent, any good Christian parent or good Christian grandparent that doesn't want to see their children and grandchildren saved. And they're burdened for them. Um, I know for us, when I, as each of our children were born, and of course we, we began talking about the Lord to them and around them for uh, years and years, as just, just laying that groundwork to help them to understand the, the, uh, the facts of the gospel so that one day they would come to the place where they could understand the purpose of the gospel and the reality of the gospel. And, and, and I'll be honest, when the last child of ours when Elena was the last one trusted Christ, there was a great relief, a burden lifted in the home, and rightly so. We were burdened for our children. Uh, we are burdened. It's easy to be burdened for family members that are lost because we love them, because we care for them. I say this, it, it's easier to have a burden for close maybe acquaintances or friends or even neighbors, maybe people that we interact with, maybe a co-worker. It's easier maybe to have the burden for that person than just average Joe in town. Why? Because we are, that's sort of how we just are relation, relationally with people. Um, I can remember probably there, there have been, I guess as I narrow things down in my mind, there have been three specific maybe we say times or groups of, of, of place of times in my life where I can remember having a, a tremendous burden for lost people, and, and one being my children, of course. Uh, another, I remember when we were in Georgia, and we began to uh, work with the teenage, and we started going out, and we started picking up kids, and we had a great bus worker, uh, bus captain, uh, Gene Sims, who just recently went home to be with the Lord, good man. And uh, we would go, I'd go out with him, we'd go on bus visitation, and we started bringing in teenagers from our community who'd never, most of them never been in church at all, or some of them if they had, not in any kind of a Bible preaching church. And we started having 15, 20 teenagers that started coming out, just who'd never heard, and honestly, a lot of them, I think they just wanted somebody to care for them and show concern to them. And they started coming, and they didn't know I mean, they didn't know anything about the Bible. They didn't know anything about Jesus. And I can remember, I can remember specifically saying, God, and the Lord had been working on my heart in regards to, I, you know, I wasn't sure how, you know, we, we were there in Georgia knowing that God had called me to pastor, but we weren't, he hadn't opened up those doors yet. And I can remember praying, God, while I'm here, I, I, would you help me to reach these young people? And what we saw, almost, almost all of them that we had come through that came, started coming to church on any kind of regular basis, almost all of them trusted Christ as Savior. Praise the Lord. And there was a burden to see these young people who, would, who, who had no gospel influence of any kind in their home, who had no godly influence many times in their home, many of them even coming from, um, from so different, there were so, so many cultures there in that greater Atlanta area, um, whether it be from other nations, other religions, some of them who uh, parents would have nothing to do maybe with Jesus Christ, but they were glad to let their kids go out of the house with somebody who would take, take them off their hands for a while. I can remember the burden and God working. I can remember there was a time here at our church a few years back. I remember there was, a, there was probably a, a, a three-month span in our church where we had um, a bunch of kids, all just young people, teenagers, 
uh, kids all just getting saved. I mean, to the point where uh, I just remember just saying, Lord, I'm looking and I'm seeing these young people who are not saved. Lord, would I pray they get saved. And, and whether it be through, uh, there are some days I'd just say, hey, can you come and talk to me after the service? And, they, and, and people getting saved. It was just a, just a tremendous time burden because they were people in our church. Listen, there have been individuals. I can remember there have been families that have come through. And you see that family and you think, man, they need to be saved. They don't understand what's going on. And just having a burden to reach them. But sometimes, just being honest, some days you go through and you say, well, I know that I'm supposed to tell people about Jesus. And it's easy to almost even, if I can say this way, go through the motions of, well, I'm giving out gospel tracts. I might say something to somebody, invite them to the church or whatever. But it's easy, and I think it's because it's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual warfare. It's easy for our flesh to become sometimes deadened, if I could say it that way, to the need or to the burden to reach people with the gospel. John 4, that we see with the disciples, and as they're, with Jesus is speaking with the woman at the well, they went, walked right past her. As she's coming to the well. They're in down the city. And it's those same people that Jesus then reaches through the testimony of the woman at the well. They didn't think about it. And Jesus told them, he said, lift up your eyes. He said, look, look, under the fields, look, there, see what's out there. It's wide of the harvest. And I think sometimes we're limited. We, again, we, we know that we're supposed to preach the gospel. We know that, we're, that, that we have tools like, uh, like gospel tracts, that we have tools... We have the Bible in our hand. We can go out with a New Testament and show people, and, I, and we can go through and we'll have, and we will again go through different uh, ways to share the gospel. But it's not really a priority because we're not burdened. Am I making sense to you all tonight? W- would you be honest with me? My hand's going up first. Would you be honest and say, say I, I, I've been guilty of Times not having a burden to really reach people. Would you raise your hand? Okay. I'm not, like I've said, a lot of, it seems a lot of messages recently. This message is not to say you bunch of no good, lousy Christians with no burden for souls. Tonight's message is this. How do we get that burden back? Not just to say, well, I know that the command is there, so I, I ought to. I'm talking about that burden. When your kids needed to be saved, when that one that you loved needed to be saved, said, God, would you please save? I, it, it was one of those things that it was just on your mind on a regular basis. But I think so often when, we, when, when everybody that's close to us is covered, if I could say it that way, it's awful easy just to not have a burden. Paul says, I have a burden, so much that it, if, if I could, I would trade my eternal destiny for my nation to be saved. What do we do to get the burden? Now, one, one thing, obviously, just on a practical level, again, we go back to John 4, I think sometimes we just don't really look to see people. We don't have compassion because we, they're just sort of people walking by. And I say we because it's we. Uh, one of the, I'll tell you this. One of the convic- convicting things of hanging out with my dad. Now, my dad is a people person. If you didn't get, figure that out, he's a people person. I mean, he'll, he'll talk to anybody and it doesn't matter where they are, what they're doing. And, and there, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm just going to be honest with you. There are some times when he was here, we're going to the store, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, we've got to get this, 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 get out here, do this, do that. Next thing up, where'd he go? And I realize he's two aisles back talking to somebody. And I'm thinking, I would have never thought to do that. Now, you might say, well, that's his personality, and that's your personality. And there is some truth to that. But are our personalities 
are, I would say this, are our personalities an excuse to disobey God? No. I mean, uh, somebody could say, and they do say, we'll use one of these, we'll use one of those real bad sins. Well, my, I'm, that's just who I am. I'm attracted to the opposite sex. And we would say, it doesn't matter even if you feel that way. It's wrong. You need to stop doing that. That's what we would say. And amen, that's true. You need to let Jesus deliver you from that. And we'll, we'll, and we'll be glad to tell people that. But at the same time, then we'll say, well, I can't really talk to people about the Lord because, you know, I'm shy. And yet, the reality is, what we're doing is we're saying, well, this is just who I am. And... Because of who I am, I have excuse to disobey God. That's what we're, in essence, saying. Because it's still a command to reach people, right? And sometimes it's just, we might say, well, it's our person. Going back to my dad, one of the, I said it was one of those convicting things. Is, is There are days I, I think to myself, I would never thought to just stop and even have that conversation. It wasn't even that he necessarily even led the person to the Lord in the aisle at the store. But it got a whole lot further, and I just started to talk about the Lord, got a whole lot further than I, ne- than I did when I didn't even think about it. Why didn't I think about it? Sometimes because we're so tunnel vision, got this, 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 and this that we have to do, and I know we're busy, but we just don't see people. We know this fact. Every person we meet is heading one of two places. Currently, right now, is heading one of two places, either heaven or hell. Amen? We know that fact. But it's not something that burdens us to the point of doing something about it at times. Again, I'm, I'm talking in a general basis. Just about every hand went up and said, yeah, I've had those times. You, you may be here tonight and you might say, listen, this is, not, this is not me today. And if that's the case, praise God. But what is it? Sometimes it's just the fact that we just don't See, we don't look, we don't recognize people as souls in need of a Savior. If you see somebody in need, more times than not, it, it, that's, I'll say this way, you, you'll become more burdened for someone when you see their, I'm just going on a physical level, if you see somebody with a physical need, you're far more burdened to help them once you see them than if you've never even looked at them. Where, Kenzie's here somewhere. Where is she? Oh, there she is. I started to look on the corner, and I thought, because, you know, for, she's had a... How many of you in the last few weeks have gone out of your way in some form or fashion to try to be a help to Kenzie while she was either in a wheelchair or in a... You don't have to raise your hand. I'm just, or on the crutches. We've done something to say, well, oh, let, let me help you out with that. Or here, let me carry that for you. Or let's do this. Let's do that. Uh, let, let's, let's help her get her stuff into the vehicle, all those things. And yet the reality is, is that there's a lot of people right now in our community that are on crutches or in wheelchairs that we haven't done anything for. Why? The difference is we've seen her and we said, oh, let's help her. We can do something for her because we've actually noticed the need. Spiritually speaking, a lot of times we just don't take the time to notice the need because we become so focused on what we're doing. Am I making sense to you all? How is it that we develop the burden? One is that we have to actually see people for who they are. But I think, and this, this is going to sound almost too simple, too basic, but that's where we get ourselves at. This afternoon, side note, this afternoon, was it you? We were watching, uh, I turned the TV on. We, we normally watch uh, like Little House of the Prayer or something in the afternoon on Sunday afternoon. And uh, but I turned it on, there was a college basketball game on. And uh, uh, about three trips down, the one team, they got the ball literally right under the basket. All the guy had to do was just, I mean, and he's already six foot eight. He's already tall enough. To, you know, three times in a row, missed the layup. Missed, and I, first time it happened, I said, oh, I, mean, I started yelling at the TV. It sounded like my wife. And you, you're supposed to make that. You can't miss that. And the next time down, and then by the third time, my boys are like, oh, I Micah says, this team's doing terrible. They can't do anything. And they missed layup after layup after layup. And was it you who, who made this? She said, oh, 
Sounds like it's time for a sermon on basics, on, on, on how to get those lamps. And so, here we are. It might sound basic, it might sound simple. I think a lot of times what it is, is we just don't ask God to burden us. Now let me ask you. The Bible teaches us, 1 John 5, talks about the fact that when we ask God according to his will, that he'll grant those things. Would you agree, as we've already seen, that God wants people saved? That is a part of his burden. We, we've already seen it. And so if we were to say, God, would you give us that burden? Do you think that God would say, I can do that? Do you think God would want, to, want us to be burdened? Yeah. Why, why is it that we don't have a burden, and I think that a lot of times what it comes down to ultimately, that just, my, just share my heart, is we just have no burden, and we've never bothered to ask God to give us that burden. The reason a lot of times, whether in this context or anything, one of the reasons a lot of times why we don't ask God to do some of these things is because if we do, and he answers, then we're accountable this is how we think, I think, human nature. This is, we're accountable to do something about it. So it's easier just to ignore. It's easier to just ignore and not deal with it. But there are people all around us who need to be saved. There are people that we deal with on a regular basis around us. I'm not just talking about uh, the person that you passed in the, in the aisle at Walmart. I'm talking about there are people that we deal with on a regular basis that need to be saved. And one of the biggest reasons we've not done anything about it is because we just have no burden for it. We're thankful to be saved ourselves. We rejoice in that. We're glad that God died to save others. And we hope somebody reaches that person that we pass multiple times a week. So what do we do? What do we do? The uh, Bible, think about burden. Uh, we sang the song, Rescue the Perishing. And then we sang the song, uh, Bring in the Sheaves. Uh, Bring in the Sheaves, uh, even in the hymn book, it talks about uh, Psalm 126, 5 and 6. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again through joy, and bring his sheaves with them. Uh, why would they weep? Because they had a burden. So, my thoughts as we as I try to put this all together is this. First of all, do, do, you have, do you have a burden for souls? Secondly, if you don't, do you want one? Do you want a burden for souls? If you don't have a desire for a burden for souls, I think the Bible would teach that we're in sin and we ought to ask God to forgive us and give us the burden for souls. Maybe you are part of the group that would say, I want to reach people. I know I'm supposed to. I just don't have that drive to do so. Why? Because we're not burdened. We had a drive to reach our kids with the gospel. Why? Because we loved them. We were burdened for them. I had a drive to reach those teenagers because I loved them and I had a burden for them. I had a drive to reach, I've had a drive to reach people that have come to our church and kids that have grown up in our church and to see them saved. Why? Because I loved them and I had a burden for them. But I don't have the proper burden that I ought to for the people in Jamestown or in Greenville. I'm not saying that I don't try to reach them. I'm just saying that if I went through the day, I'm just being honest. If I went through the day and I realized I never talked to one person about the Lord Jesus Christ today. It doesn't, it hasn't bothered me like it should. Well, why, why, why would I be able to go through the day and then not be bothered about it? It's because I just don't have the burden that God would want me to have. 
And so tonight, my, my request, my challenge would be this. Let's ask God, number one, to give you an individually, not just the crowd, you individually in your seat, a burden, a sustaining burden for the lost. Ask God to give you individually a sustaining burden for the loss. Not just, a, well, I, I, I need to reach somebody tomorrow, and then by Tuesday, well, eh, that, that was good for a day. I'm talking about regular, regularly. We, we, all, we all believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming soon, correct? Amen. And that the Bible teaches that once he comes, there's going to be a lot of people, I'll say it this way, that there, there will be people who get saved during the tribulation time, but it's a small portion of people. That I wouldn't want to count on the, the odds of saying I get to be one of the ones when you see all the billions who are killed and all the billions who reject Christ and don't even, in spite of all of the, the judgments that come, they don't even humble themselves before God. There are people that need to be reached. So we ought to pray, first of all, that you, me, that we Individually, God, would you give me that burden for souls? Secondly, we ought to pray that God would give each other a burden for souls. You may not pray for yourself to get one, but I'm going to pray that you do. <laughs> and you pray for me. Does that make sense? So, I, so first I want to say, I, I want to pray that I get it. Same time, I want to pray that you all get a burden. If we get a, if 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 we take the next, I, mean, I don't know. We'll see as the Lord leads. But if we t say we take the next three Sunday nights to go over practical ways to how how to reach people with the gospel, if you don't have a burden for people, and you, you, you it'll be very easy to just come and say, well, that's interesting, but I'm never going to use that. Well, preacher, who would think that? Most Americans or most Christians in in our American churches. It's the truth. Just look at statistics. So we need to pray. Number one, God, would you burden me for souls? I think about in the book of, uh, the word burden is not used much in the Bible, but I think about in Habakkuk, he says the burden of Habakkuk, uh, his burden was for his nation, Judah. And he, and he was so desperate, he cried out to God, God, would you do something? The, the, things are not right. And he couldn't help himself because of the burden that he carried. God, would you give me that kind of burden for the lost? Not just for my family, not just for my close friends, but for anyone and everyone that I come in contact with. And then, God, would you give our church folks a burden? God, would you give my pastor a greater burden to reach us? We could give you all, the, all of the ins and outs and how to use the Bible. But if you don't care about, if we don't have that burden for the souls, we won't use it like we should. So we need to pray. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? Before I even pray, let me ask you this. No one else is looking. How many tonight would say, Pastor, I, don't, don't raise your hand because you think, because you think I want you to. I just want you to be honest with me and God. How many tonight would say, Pastor, I want to have a burden for souls. I want God to give me that burden. Would you raise your hand? Put your hands down. Because anybody might say, God, Pastor, God has given me a burden. And I, I, I'm, I don't not to say the exception of the world, but I, I'm at a place right now where God has already dealt with me on this issue, and, I, and God has granted me a burden for souls. I'm doing my very best right now for the Lord. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I just want to pray for you. Again, thank you. How many would say, Pastor, I will 
commit tonight to praying for myself to have that continual burden and for our church folks, including you, Pastor, to have that burden for souls. If that's you, would you just lift your hand? I'm going to make that commitment tonight. Our Heavenly Father, I, I believe our folks, I trust our folks enough to believe that they're not just lifting their hand to, to appease their pastor. Lord, I think they love me enough that they would be willing to, but I don't believe that's the case tonight. I think that we have a church full of folks that are serious about this matter. Lord, we, we pray for souls to be saved. But oftentimes I think we need to pray that you would burden us and use us to see those souls saved. Lord, that we'd have such a desire, Lord, that it wouldn't just be that we are focused on our, maybe our fears, our insecurities, or using our personality, or using our, our tendencies, or as excuses, but rather, Lord, that we would to say, Lord, help me to put my flesh and myself out of the way so that I can be obedient to you. Lord, help me to have that overriding burden that puts aside fear. Lord, I pray that you would help me to have a greater burden for the Lord. I thank you that even this week, this past week, Lord, had opportunity to talk to folks about Christ, areas that in recent times I probably would not have done so, would not have thought to do so. And I thank you, Lord, that even just by, in preparation for this message, Lord, the burden that you have laid on my heart, Lord, help me to make it, Lord, I pray this burden will be just as real today and tomorrow and the next day for the next months and years to come. Or until you return. Lord, I pray that our folks would have the same burden. Lord, I, I know our flesh. I, I know, Lord, we can sincerely, wholeheartedly say right now, I, I want that burden. We can sincerely and wholeheartedly say, I'm going to pray to have this burden and for others to have it as well. And yet, Lord, our flesh still will battle against us and the decisions we make tonight are easily, we're easily distracted from them. Lord, would you just help us to be focused on this thought for the rest of our lives, honestly. Lord, that we would have a burden. Lord, I pray that even right now, you would put somebody in the, in the minds and the hearts of our people right now, that every individual in this room right now Every Christian would have a person right now in their heart and their mind that you bring to their attention that needs Christ. And Lord, that we would seek them out this week to follow the burden that you've given us to preach the gospel to those folks. Lord, I, I think... That this could be, I, I know this could be a tremendous year for you. I know this can be a, a time, Lord, that we see many, many people saved. Lord, there's so many people looking. Would you help us to have the heart desire, as Paul did, as you did, to reach people? Lord, not for our glory, but for yours. Lord, that we could Show people the hope that comes in Jesus Christ for an eternal destiny with you. Lord, would you bless us? Would you help us in these coming weeks? Lord, not just to say, well, okay, that's an interesting way to use the Bible, but to say, I can't wait to find another way, another tool, another method to use to help as I go forth with this burden. Lord, I ask that you would just bless our church. 
I thank you for our people. Thank you for their faithfulness and their willingness, Lord, to come out and hear a preaching. And Lord, on a night like tonight with a little bit kind of different tone, Lord, to respond so well. I pray, Lord, that you just go before us. Lord, that we would be used to reach many, many, many people for the cause of Christ. We thank you and we love you. And we ask this in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Let's find in our hymn. Let's find, uh, give out the good news. Anybody know what number is, it is? Is it maybe, could it be 586 or something like that maybe? Or? Nope, that's not it. Anybody know what it is yet? G, that's a, look it up here, give out, 286, that's what it is, 286. I was close, only 300 pages off, but I was close to the number. 286, let's stand together, let's sing 286, and give out the good news. Sandy, why don't you come to the piano for us, and we'll sing all three verses of this, and then we'll be dismissed. 286, give out the good news. <clears throat> Got it? All right. Ready? God has told us in his word of Jesus' power to save from sin. We must tell this news to all, every precious soul to win. Give out the good news to someone today. Tell them of Jesus, the truth and the way. He conquered the grave that all could be saved. So give out the good news today. Take the news to every land. For every person must be told. Never stopping, pressing on. Till they're safe within the fold. Give out the good news to someone today. Tell them of Jesus, the truth and the way. He conquered the grave that all can be saved. So give out the good news today. When we stand before God's throne to give account for deeds we've done, will there be some there with you that you brought to God's dear Son? Give out the good news to someone today. Tell them of Jesus, the truth and the way. He conquered the grave that all could be saved. So give out the good news today. Thank you for being here tonight. You are dismissed. Have a great evening.